Okay, good morning, everybody. We're just um, waiting for uh, attendees to join. So we'll just give it one minute and then we'll start the, um, the webinar from this morning. So a warm welcome to you all. Okay, the participants have become quite stable now, so I think we'll we'll make a start, but I think others will uh, join us as we as we go through. So a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, my name is Richard Montague. I'm a, a partner in the London private client team. Um, I'm also a, the ex chairman of the Global Private Client Centre of Excellence for a private client team for BDO internationally. Uh, so I've been invited back as a, as a bit of a guest today to, uh, to, to chair this session. Um, so a very warm welcome to you all and a, and, a, and a big thanks as well. So we've got attendees from all over the globe, from Indonesia to Luxembourg to Switzerland to the US. Um, and it's with, only with your support that we can make these, uh, this series of webinars a success. So a huge thank you to you all before we move on to any further. Um, this is the third of our series of World of Private Client webinars. Uh, we're focusing on relocation today. Uh, we're going to be talking to a, a panel of experts on a number of matters, but around the push and pull factors for relocation. Um, also looking at some of the, the trends that we're seeing in our various home countries and where people are relocating to. And, and also how this has been impacted by COVID. And um, so we're going to spend the first, uh, I'm, I'm going to just spend a few minutes introducing this, um, and then we're going to spend about 40 minutes on a, on a, on a panel discussion. And then we've got uh, time for a Q&A at the end for about 15 minutes. So if you have any questions as you're going along, please post them in the, the Q&A uh, section, which you should see at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to pick them up. If we don't pick them up during this session, then hopefully we'll, uh, one of our experts will get back to you after the session, at least anyway. So first of all, let me introduce our speakers today. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Brad Norris, who is a colleague of mine from BDO in the UK. He's a director in the internet on the, on the, on the start again, in the entrepreneurial private wealth team. Um, and he's represented the UK as part of the BDO Global Private Client Centre of Excellence for a number of years now, and has significant experience advising individuals relocating to and from the UK with a particular focus on Portugal. Um, and next we have Tamara Peters van Nijnhoff, who's joining us from BDO in the Netherlands. Um, I've known Tamara for, for many years and she uh, chairs the European Centre of Excellence for Private Clients for, for BDO and uh, focuses her time on advising international succession planning trusts and charitable foundations and investing abroad. And finally, a huge thank you to Alex Hood, who joins us as a guest speaker today from immigration law firm uh, Fragman, where he's a senior associate and solicitor and he has years of experience in UK immigration law. Um, and as part of the worldwide private client practice, he advises clients on complex immigration matters and acts for high net worth individuals. Before we, before we go on to the rest of the introduction, Alex, would you just like to introduce yourself and just say a few words so we get to know you a bit better? Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, so it's a pleasure to be, to be part of the discussion today. Uh, as you mentioned, my specialism is UK immigration law, where for nine years I've advised private clients on all aspects of relocating to and remaining in the UK. So I provide advice on the full range of immigration categories from tier one investor visas and global talent applications for world leading tech entrepreneurs to British citizenship applications for clients and their families. And of course, applications under the EU settlement scheme uh, post Brexit. And I've got a particular specialism in advising high net worth individuals uh, and their families on the immigration elements of complex relocations to the UK. 
working closely with tax advisors like NDO, but family offices and, and other professionals to ensure that a relocation achieves the, the client's uh, objectives. Uh, and as you mentioned, I'm also part of Fregman's worldwide private client practice. So uh, that's a specialist practice where we advise clients on applications for residence and citizenship by way of investment, uh, and in some cases through ancestral lineage uh, to various jurisdictions worldwide, such as Portugal, Spain, and Malta, and then further afield, such as Australia and New Zealand. Fantastic. Thank you, Alex. That's uh, It sounds like quite a complex role you've got there. So <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you here this morning and hopefully you can help uh, with the discussion around some of the immigration issues that we're going to be um, talking about. Um, first of all, what I would like to do is just introduce our World of Private Client series, as I mentioned. So we, we um, uh, undertook a survey uh, about 12 months ago for 350 private clients and their advisors split roughly, you know, more than 50% of the clients, less than 50% advisors. And there were some really interesting key findings within that, that survey uh, that I just wanted to share with you today. Uh, so we found initially that a lot of our clients were adopting a bit of a wait and see approach to COVID, uh, but that's more recently been uh, replaced by um, some real actionable plans that we're seeing, and there's a lot of activity in that area. Um, there was a feeling that taxes are going to rise on an international level, um, all around the globe. Um, there was a, uh, also a feeling that um, the wealth creators are seeking more diverse portfolios um, and looking for alternative investments to what they have um, been, you know, to look for in the past. And, and, and there's a real drive for um, new generations creating increased focus on ESG issues, which I know is a, is a topic which is close to many of our hearts as well. But, but focusing more on what the topic is today around relocation, we found that there's a real shift in, um, uh, I guess, drivers for people relocating um, from the UK and um, you know wherever their home countries may be. 63% uh, of respondents said that economic, political and social instability would prompt a trend towards individuals relocating. And 80% of respondents stated that political stability is one of the key decisions in their choice of where to relocate to. And that's ahead of lifestyle, which is at 72%. So there's a real shift from what we've seen before in the past. Political stability is, is, is really you know, very much at the forefront of uh, the decisions to relocate and where to relocate to. Um, and, and tax is no longer the key driver. Um, it was before in the past at some point, but um, it's further down the list. It's a, it's a key consideration at 63%, but it's not a driver. Um, many moons ago, we used to talk to people about relocating to tax havens around the world. Um, and that's just really, you know, just a thing of the past. We don't, we don't see that anymore. And in fact, what we do see is that most countries have um, favourable tax regimes for new residents. And um, so you can go to the unexpected countries, if you like, and find that actually you can live there very tax efficiently. And it happens to be one of the places that you, you want to go to live to as well. Um, and the type of incentives that they have are lower tax rates for new residents, um, taxation on local source income only. Uh, some countries have lump sum tax regimes like Switzerland or the remissive places like the UK. Um, and what we'll do is we'll share after this webinar a copy of our Global Opportunities Report, which is a, um, is a study that we undertook a, a couple of years ago, looking at um, tax efficient jurisdictions around the world. And it's some real surprising places in there that you wouldn't expect. Um, so definitely worth a read. Um, so that, that, that's the intro from me. What I'd like to do is um, now just move on to our panel discussion. And we're gonna um, start by looking at the, the push factors as to why people are relocating from their home countries. And um, so Brad, maybe we'll start with you. Just, just give us a bit of a feeling of what you're seeing for people leaving the UK. Yeah, um, certainly, Rich, we're still seeing people leave the UK. Um, but I, I think the factors which uh, the driving factors which were um, shown by the research we undertook um, in, in 2019, I think they are still the main driving factors. So we're seeing clients um, still searching for the political stability, the lifestyle, um, good education for children, etc. I, was, I would have thought healthcare would have been a bit more um, 
of a driving factor now, but the clients who I've actually seen relocate, that hasn't actually been a top priority. They've actually said, look, wherever I live, as long as the infrastructure is there, they, they're going to have the, the healthcare. Um, if not, I can travel back to the UK. Um, so that hasn't been a driving factor. So I haven't really seen a change in, in those factors as such, but recent events have obviously um, changed people's mindset. Um, so lockdown has shown that we can all work remotely. Um, it, it, the possibility is um, much stronger now. So we've seen some clients looking to perhaps relocate to be closer with their families um, or just looking for a physical base rather than um, somewhere where they can have easy travel into a city, et cetera. Um, so they're happy to go to a, a country where they view it is a nicer lifestyle, um, have that as a physical base to work from and then tr travel as required. Um, COVID-19 has seen a lot of people sort of reassess their priorities as well. Um, so we've seen some people bring forward their planned re retirements a bit earlier, perhaps bringing in the next generation in their family or just taking a backward step and letting the, the, the managers of their businesses take over more of the day-to-day -day running um, and they just get involved in the bigger decisions. Others have brought forward their planned relocations um, by a couple of years anyway, um, just reassessing their priorities and what's important to them, perhaps just slowing down life. Um, Brexit has probably not been a direct impact as such in terms of the um, taxation of private individuals, but certainly it has affected their relocation decisions, particularly if um, they wanted to spend time in the, in the Schengen region. So a lot of our clients tend to have um, second homes, holiday homes, et cetera, in the area. And if they want to visit those homes as much as they used to, plus allow for business travel into the region, perhaps visiting some of the other countries in the region. They, we're seeing that they are very quickly getting up to their, their limit from an immigration perspective, which I'm, I'm sure um, Alex can touch on. But that's then influencing their decision in terms of where they actually want to live. So we've seen some clients just exiting the UK um, to take up full-time residence in, the, in the, one of the countries in the Schengen region to allow flexibility of their travel. Um, and obviously that the non-DOMs living in the UK, they've always planned to leave the UK um, but ahead of becoming deemed domiciled after 15 years. So we're seeing the non-DOMs leave the UK as planned, perhaps bringing forward those plans a little bit earlier for the reasons I just mentioned. Um, I would say in all cases, my clients certainly, they still want to spend time in the UK. So they're still visiting the UK, seeing friends, family, et cetera. So a lot of them will perhaps keep a property in the UK. Um, so I suppose that's just where some good advice comes into play to make sure they're not um, remaining UK tax resident as well and find themselves um, as dual tax resident, which brings a lot of complications with that. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that, Brad. And I, I, I like the plug there for good, good, good tax advice <laughs> as well. So that's appreciated. Um, Alex, just moving to, on to you as well. So just from an immigration perspective, I mean, Brad's mentioned that there's um, restrictions on time that people can spend in the Schengen area and the complications that Brexit's brought. Um, have, have you seen that this has impacted um, your clients in you know, decisions to relocate? Yeah, absolutely. It, it has had a, a reasonably significant impact. Um, and of course, you know, for British citizens, of course, before Brexit, they could live and work in, in any EU country without restriction or any further documentation. Um, but with free movement having ended, you know, the situation is now very different. And as Brad mentioned, there are there are restrictions for British citizens in the in the Schengen area. Um, they can only spend up to 90 days in that area in any 180 day period. Um, and you can't essentially be living um, in, the, in the Schengen area on that basis. Um, and so anything longer than that, they'll now need a visa to, to show that they've got a formal right of residence in a, in a particular EU country. Um, and so certainly relocating to the, to the EU for British citizens requires now longer term planning. Uh, so what we're seeing is actually increasingly British citizens are looking for alternative ways to regain free, freedom of movement or right of residence throughout the EU. And as Brad mentioned, that there are a number of uh, factors behind this facilitate ease of doing business or just flexibility of travel throughout the Schengen area uh, as part of a formal relocation. Um, and we're also seeing a, 
uh, sort of a form of succession planning almost for their family. So we've seen people exploring acquiring uh, EU citizenship for their children. So it can give them the opportunity to travel and study throughout the EU in the future. And so it's seen as an increasingly sort of important investment in their family's future. Uh, and that's not just restricted to British citizens. I think Brexit has really sharpened the focus on the benefits that freedom of movement offers to not only to, to immediate family, but next generation. And so we're seeing other international families looking at how they can achieve this, this flexibility. Uh, and, and whilst we're on this topic, on, on the other side of the, the coin, um, Brexit's also heavily impacted EU citizens who either already resident in the UK or um, looking to, to relocate to the UK. Uh, so you know, we've seen some EU citizens leave the UK and that's led to some sort of short term sector specific uh, labour shortages, but a huge number of EU citizens have applied to remain in the UK. Um, and I was just looking at the, the latest quarterly figures and there's been over 5 million concluded applications to the EU settlement scheme in the UK from Euro European citizens and, and their family members. So um, a huge amount of, of citizens have decided to remain in the UK. And I should just say on that point that whilst the deadline for those applications was 30th of June 2021, the Home Office are still considering late applications and, and being relatively sympathetic to those. So at this stage, it will be challenging but it's still worth exploring if, if EU citizens with prior residence in the UK are, are looking at if there are any options to sort of secure their stay or, or perhaps to, to bring their family members to the UK. Uh, so yeah, just to sort of reiterate for, for EU citizens looking to re relocate, the importance of forward planning is, is absolutely vital because obviously it's no longer possible for EU citizens to, to enter the UK at the border and, and, and live and work here. They will need a formal immigration status if they're going to stay in the UK long term. So engaging with solicitors and, and tax advisors in advance and, and planning in advance is, is increasingly important. Absolutely, absolutely, and I agree with that. And we talk about freedom of movement, um, which, of course, we talk about uh, from an immigration perspective, or, or even you know from a tax perspective, in a certain extent. But um, COVID has impacted us massively on our on our ability to to freely move, uh, which we'll come on to that a little bit later. But first, Tamara, maybe maybe you can sort of talk a little bit wider around Europe. Is there is there any trends that we're seeing around the push factors that are driving people to leave their home countries in, in wider Europe? Uh, yes, uh, we definitely see similar trends in Europe. Uh, relocations are less tax driven than they um, used to be. And it has becoming more and about, more and more about uh, finding a more relaxed way of life or relocate to a place where the weather is better than in the Netherlands and in the UK. Um, or um, they would like to relocate for business opportunities. But um, it's not um, that they are less tax driven, but it's not um, that taxes are not considered uh, anymore at all. Uh, like the BDO research also showed, you just mentioned that 65 of the respondents indicated that the tax landscape uh, yeah, is still one of the key considerations. So yes, taxes are still an important factor when someone is considering to uh, relocate. And in my opinion, in particular, the levy of wealth tax and inheritance tax. Uh, many clients tend to see those um, taxes as kind of unfair. Uh, they accept that they have to pay uh, income tax uh, regarding their income. But if subsequently they also have to pay wealth tax on what they save from their income, and then subsequently also inheritance tax or gift tax when they pass it on to their children, yeah, quite some clients tend to see that as uh, unfair. And we see that also now what is going on in Germany and Norway, for example, both countries had elections uh, this year and have a new government. Uh, regarding to Germany, um, they are worried that the new government will impose a higher um, income tax 
and that they also will reduce the wealth tax because for the moment Germany doesn't know any wealth tax. So they're afraid that also that will be reintroduced alongside the inheritance tax they already have. So many clients, German clients, are uh, therefore considering to move to one of the neighbor countries of Germany. And it's kind of the same what's going on in Norway. They also had elections a couple of weeks ago and a new government um, um, yeah, they were it's more left orientated than the old one. So there are some speculations that if the government, government uh, will reintroduce an inheritance tax because Norway hasn't any inheritance tax for the moment. But on top of that, also increase the wealth tax and the personal income tax as well. And it's a lot in the Norwegian newspapers for the moment that in particular because of this higher wealth tax and also uh, in combination with the inheritance tax, uh, more Norwegian people will consider to relocate. So I guess this shows um, that taxes are still an uh, important key aspect when someone considers to relocate, even when relocate, relocations in general are uh, less tax driven than they used to be in the past. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, you, you bring out an important point there, which is we talk about political stability, but yeah. of course, political stability, you know, brings um, to a certain extent tax stability as well and changes in governments create changes in taxes and and yeah. to the point of introducing new types of taxes like wealth taxes and inheritance tax that wasn't there before could, of course, drive people's decisions to relocate, which is political in its own right as well um so we talked a little bit about the push factors there but what about the pull factors what, what what's enticing people to move to certain um jurisdictions tomorrow maybe um, just carry on with europe i mean what, where do you where are the hot favorites where do you see people moving to um, I think the hot favorites are still the traditional countries where clients really catered to in the past, such as Spain and Switzerland. But over the last years, um, I see that Italy also has become one of the favorites. And it's the same for Austria. Now, if we look at Austria, Austria isn't really seen as a low tax jurisdiction. Though Austria doesn't levy any inheritance tax or gift tax, it has a very high income tax rate and it goes up to 55%. So that's uh, quite high. But um, yeah, so I don't think that Austria is really attractive from a tax perspective. Um, but due to a very stable economy and also a very high quality of living, I think um, that are the reasons that Austria is becoming more and more popular as an immigration country. And regarding the other countries I just mentioned, Spain, Switzerland and Italy, what they all have in common is that they have a very attractive tax regime for new residents, for private individuals. Um, so if we look at Italy. Italy knows two very favorable tax regimes for new residents. First of all, they have the flat tax regime. So based on that regime, someone can opt to pay a flat tax of 100,000 euros, and then he won't be taxed for foreign income anymore. So only his um, Italian sourced income will be taxed. And the same applies then to the inheritance and gift tax. Only Italian assets will be taxed with inheritance and gift tax if someone applies for the flat tax uh, regime. And of course, you have to meet some conditions. Um, it's only applicable for 15 years, but I think it's a very attractive regime for new um, tax residents. And beside that flat tax, flat tax regime, Italy also has the new worker regime that can also be very attractive for new tax residents. Um, Based on this regime, individuals who move to Italy for work reasons can benefit of a 70% exemption of their salary. And if they move to specific regions in the south of Italy, um, they even can benefit of a 90% exemption. And this is uh, applicable for five years, but it can easily be extended to 10 years. And it might also be good to mention that there was a recent ruling um, that was stating that this regime also uh, is applicable to new tax 
uh, Italian tax residents who remain working remotely from Italy for their foreign uh, for their current employer in their previous home country. So, for example, uh, Richard, you keep working for BDO UK, but you move uh, to Italy, become a tax That's resident right. from there. You can work remotely from Italy and then you can apply for this new workers regime and depending where are you going to uh, live in Italy, you will have a 70% or 19% exemption um, on your salary. So I think that's very uh, attractive uh, about Italy. Uh, regarding Spain and uh, Switzerland, they also have both favorable regimes. In a nutshell, uh, Spain has the Beckham law. Uh, based on that uh, law, only salary income will be taxed on a worldwide basis and all other uh, income will only be taxed if it's um, Spanish sourced. And the same applies then to the wealth tax, only the Spanish assets will be um, taxed. For the moment, the Beckham law is only applicable for six years, but probably this will be increased till 11 years. Of course, you have to meet some conditions, but this is also a very attractive system. And lastly, regarding to Switzerland, uh, besides that Switzerland uh, has a very stable economy and uh, also offers a very high quality of living, Switzerland is also attractive from a tax perspective. Firstly, because they don't live any inheritance or gift tax on a national levy uh, level. They only levy that on a cantonal levy, but most uh, cantons have an exemption if the recipient is the surviving spouse or the children. Uh, but furthermore, Switzerland, Switzerland also um, has in most cantons the partial ruling or the lump sum taxation you just spoke about, um, Richard, in the beginning. And based on this regime, not the actual income and the actual wealth will be taxed, but a fixed amount that is related to the annual living cost um, will be considered. Um, so I think um, that's also why Switzerland is a very, uh, yeah, attractive country to really create to. So I think, yeah, Spain, Switzerland, uh, Italy, Austria are the hot favorite countries for the moment for Europeans who can move to. That's interesting. Thank you very much. And um, Austria is a surprising entry on yeah. that list, it has to be said. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Brad, coming to you, um, and maybe just uh, keep this um, slightly brief if you can, just for, for, yeah. for time. Um, where are Brits going to? What's hot, hot favorites? Very similar to um, what tomorrow has just covered for um, the Europeans. So um, Spain, Switzerland have always been very popular. Um, Italy is, is becoming more and more popular. Indeed, I actually had a coffee with BDO Italy just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they were in London meeting contacts who had a lot of clients um, looking to relocate to Italy. I suppose just touching what, um, what you mentioned earlier, Richard, the, the political stability brings st stable tax regimes and the Italian um, regime has, has been around a bit longer now, a bit more stable, so it, it's attracting a few more. Um, Cyprus with their non-DOM regime, um, Singapore, people seeing Brits moving out to Singapore, and I'm, I'm starting to see more for Austria as well, um, so similar to Tamara. Um, a a, a favourite continues to be Portugal for the Brits, um, which obviously, as you, as you mentioned at start, I, I um, deal a lot with Portugal. And yeah, weekly we're seeing um, um, requests for information about relocating to Portugal. Um, great climate, lifestyle, etc. It's always been very favourable, um, very popular for pensioners. So people looking to retire to Portugal, um, if you're relocating and you have a UK source pension, not every pension, but Generally speaking, it may only be taxed at 10% in Portugal. So a lot of people find the climate and, and that regime. And this regime is the non-habitual residence regime in, in Portugal, which um, can provide 10 years um, of favourable um, taxation in Portugal, where very broadly, some non-Portuguese source income wouldn't be taxed in, um, in Portugal. Um, and alongside that, you have a flat rate to 20% for certain employment or self-employment activities, which again is becoming more and more popular. I touched on it earlier. Um, some clients just looking for a physical hub now and continuing to work. So that, that's um, becoming attractive to Portugal. 
as well. And I suppose um, it's, it's established and I therefore think it's going to remain very popular going forward, um, even with some proposed golden visa changes next year, um, which are due to come in. Brilliant. Thank you. And, and, and Alex, um, uh, are you seeing the same as a, a shift towards uh, Portugal for Brits leaving? And has Brexit impacted this at all? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, as Brad said, Portugal's it's an established uh, jurisdiction and the Golden Visa programme has been in, in place for some time. Um, so I think it, it's going to remain popular for that reason, amongst others. Um, there are some significant changes coming in, in January 2022. Um, which in a nutshell restricts investment uh, in properties in high density areas such as Lisbon, Porto, the Algarve um, and some coastal destinations. Um, but at the end of 2020 we'd seen the majority of applications being investments made by, by a property um, but we think it's still going to remain very popular. Um, the, you know, the property route's not being closed, it's just being partially restricted. Um, and over the last 12 months, we've also seen an increase in people looking at making qualifying investments under the programme um, via alternative options. Um, so you can invest, for example, in, in venture capital funds in Portugal, Portuguese companies. Um, and so we've also seen people exploring those options as an alternative to, to property. Um, but yes, yeah, the, the golden visa in Portugal compares favourably with other jurisdictions. The, the investment level is, is comparatively low. So if we look at the UK, we have an investor visa, but it requires a minimum of £2 million investment, whereas Portugal is, is much lower. Um, and you know, Italy is, is similar. Um, and neither of those locations allow a qualifying investment through property, which, which Portugal will remain to, to do so. Uh, the golden visa has a, a low sort of um, minimum residence threshold so you only need to spend around seven days each year there to retain your your residence um, and other factors that have been mentioned so far are seen as politically stable um, respected healthcare system um, and then finally from our perspective it's it's digitalizing its um its, its application process and that's something we're seeing as an aspiration across you know, many different jurisdictions worldwide and you know increasingly in a post-covid world where travel physical travel is is still remaining quite difficult that's becoming quite attractive for applicants is can i make my application online at least initially and get certain way down the process before i actually have to travel to to complete it um so yeah i think it's going to remain popular but but post brexit Again, strategic planning is, is, is absolutely key and um, it's a little bit more complex. You can't, obviously, British citizens can't simply go and, and live there. So uh, planning in advance and making sure that you've, you've got the right advice is absolutely critical post-Brexit. Thank you, thank you. And actually, uh, it was, it was going to be a, a sub-question, which was around the, uh, the process of going for these uh, immigration status. Um, but you've mentioned that as well. And uh, what we'd seen is that that, that can be quite um, lengthy and antiquated by the way that, it, the, that the process works. But it's good to hear that you know, some countries are moving into the digital world and uh, making that process a little bit easier. That's, um, that's good to hear. Um, so we talked a bit about the, the, the push factors from countries, some about the pull factors. Uh, what I'd like to touch on is um, the impact that COVID's had um, because we um, have always advised our clients that good housekeeping is key. You need to keep good diary records of the countries that you're in, ensure that you're um, filing the right tax returns and keeping good records. Um, but then suddenly, you know, our clients have found themselves stuck in countries that they didn't expect to be in. Um, and um, it, that comes with a lot of um, both tax and immigration issues. So, so maybe, Brad, if we start with you, when, when we're looking at, you know, uh, the UK tax authorities, HMRC, um, what's their attitude towards, I, I guess, what we would call the accidental tax residents, people that are stuck here that didn't intend to be? Yeah, um, I think we will find out, Richard, in the, in the, <laughs> in the coming months. So um, I suppose we'll just step back. We've seen individuals become stuck in the UK. Um, during COVID. So some people visiting friends or family in the UK and, and not able to leave. Others who have been planning to relocate to the UK, who have come across to look at properties, um, look at schools, etc. And again, haven't been able to leave the UK. 
Um, the, the statutory residency test um, includes up to 60 days for exceptional circumstances, which um, very broadly can be disregarded um, in certain circumstances, the exceptional circumstances, um, and disregarded for a day count towards an individual's resident status in the UK. So HMRC um, were helpful at the, at the beginning um, with COVID-19 and lockdown, and they provided a bit of guidance on what qualifies for exceptional circumstances for COVID-19, which is helpful because previously they've always had a very narrow interpretation of what actually qualifies for exceptional circumstances. So um, the, the HMRC actually said, if you are stuck in the UK because of closures to international borders, or if you're self-isolating um, in line with government advice, or indeed if the government advice is to not to travel from the UK because of um, the virus, then those days uh, where you're in the UK could count towards exceptional circumstances, but only up to the maximum of, of 60 days. Um, but there's, I said just now, Richard, um, it's a bit uncertain what their attitude is going to be in the coming months, because the first tax returns where these exceptional circumstances are going to be relevant are going to be for 2021. So they're the tax returns which are going to be submitted in January 22. And the revenue have a year to um, look into those tax returns to raise an inquiry. Um, and what we don't know is the view they're going to take on exceptional circumstances, because um, the circumstances must have been beyond an individual's control. They couldn't have reasonably predicted or foreseen um, them not being able to leave the UK. And they must then make every effort to actually leave the UK once those restrictions have been lifted. So if, um, if we were sort of playing devil's advocate, could the revenue turn around and say, well, if you're choosing to come to the UK, um, could you have reasonably predicted that there may be travel issues with borders closing during a global pandemic um, and similarly what's their attitude to people leaving the UK so if um, an individual is coming from Singapore for example who where their, their international borders were closed are the revenue expecting those individuals to leave the UK perhaps stopping off in Europe and then traveling on to Singapore or is it reasonable to say, actually, no, they've not left the UK because they couldn't get back to Singapore and they didn't want to do stopovers during the um, COVID-19. So I think some good advice is going to be needed when preparing these tax returns because there's going to have to be disclosures to the revenue to explain why individuals qualify for exceptional circumstances. Um, and then there's a period of uncertainty for, for 12 months whilst we wait to see whether the revenue actually pick up any cases. So, yeah, I mean, it sounds like that we're just going to go through a period of uncertainty here, aren't we? And it's open to yeah. interpretation. But again, I think that's where, where good advice and the right type of disclosure becomes absolutely key um, in, in this respect as well. And, and, and Alex, just moving to you as well, um, from an immigration perspective, I mean, what happens when people are stuck in the countries they're not supposed to be in? They get a 90 day uh, holiday visa and or, you know, allowance and, and, and then they're extending beyond those days. But can't leave, um, can't be kicked out. Uh, you know, how, how do um, local countries deal with that? And what are you advising your clients? Yeah, so it's a, it's a really good question and a really important um, question from an immigration perspective. So um, you know, in those circumstances, we think that you know, prompt, targeted and, and accurate disclosure to the immigration authorities is, is extremely important. Um, you know, from a UK perspective, the, the consequences of not disclosing um, information, relevant information can be pretty severe. It could lead to the refusal of, of a visa or status, but it can also lead to, to re-entry bans in extreme circumstances where, for example, the Home Office think that, that you've not been fully open with them. So yeah, it's incredibly important to get prompt um, uh, and sound advice if, if you are in that situation. Um, and then how have we advised clients? Well, you know, if we take the UK as an example and, and, and the UK's approach, um, last year the immigration minister said in Parliament that, that nobody should be disadvantaged because of the, the COVID pandemic from an immigration perspective. Um, and so the, the government introduced COVID-19 concessions, which meant that if you had overstayed on your visa, um, then 
in, in most circumstances, a certain period of that would be disregarded if you could show that it was because of COVID-19 or travel restrictions. Um, and so the Home Office have generally tended to be quite sympathetic to people in that situation, which I think it's fair to say has not always been our experience at the Home Office over the years. So that, that's been nice to see. Um, but uh, yeah, from our perspective, it's really important to, to plan really carefully before you make any disclosures to the immigration authorities, because how you present your case and how you provide the context to what information you're, you're, you're providing is, is really important. Uh, and so from a pr practical perspective, um, you know, we've advised clients if they asked up to, to retain evidence, you know, evidence of any cancelled flights, if, for example, they were ill whilst, while stuck in a particular jurisdiction, retain evidence of, of that, any payments of hospital fees, etc. Uh, because we have seen authorities ask for evidence, simply saying that you're stuck is, has not always been enough. Um, so record keeping is, is increasingly important post-COVID. Um, and, and I would just caution that although we've seen this flexibility in, in the UK and other jurisdictions, I don't think we can assume that it's going to remain that way um, for, for too much longer in, in, in the future. Um, and so under normal circumstances, if you do stay beyond your holiday visa, for example, it can have quite um, significant, significant consequences. So again, just really important to address any issues front on, don't, don't adopt a, a wait and see approach um, and, and seek advice. And then, you know, we've seen governments being quite sympathetic in those circumstances. Okay, but well, that's good to hear. So it sounds like we've got a, a bit of an understanding from the UK, um, from tax and immigration. Tamara, um, what, what are you seeing in wider Europe? I mean, do you, do you think that there's going to be some understanding and leniency from, um, you know, wider tax authorities? Um, yes, I think uh, there will be, or at least I hope uh, there will be. Um, not many uh, countries in Europe have uh, some kind of regulation, as Brett mentions, regarding the UK that you have to disregard uh, on the circumstances the days you spent in the UK. But I think in the majority of cases, um, yeah, this won't be a problem. Uh, of course, it could happen that... Um, based on the domestic rules of a country, that someone becomes a tax resident there just because they got stuck. And in particular, if that is a country uh, that has rules stating that you are a tax resident, if you spend more than a certain amount of time in that country, for example, Italy, if you spend more than 183 days in Italy, you are deemed to be a tax resident uh, of Italy. But that's based uh, on the domestic rules of uh, Italy. And I think we also have to consider, consider the um, tax um, treaty and more specific also the OECD guidance uh, on tax treaty and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, on that. And in this guidance, uh, the OECD provides several recommendations um, how jurisdictions should apply the tax treaty on individuals that are stuck in their country because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think it's very uh, unlikely that someone who is stuck somewhere will be treated there as a tax resident on the domestic legislation, legislation also will be seen um, as a tax resident uh, from uh, a tax treaty uh, point of view because you have then to look to the tiebreaker rule and in a nutshell the tiebreaker rule uh, states that to determine someone's tax residency you first have to see where they have a permanent home. Now, most of the time that's still in their original home. Sometimes, of course, they can have a second home in that also other country. But then you have to see where the central center of vital interest is. Yeah, most of the time that's still uh, in a country where they came uh, from. Hey? You have to look with which country they have the most uh, close personal and economic uh, ties. And if you then still can't uh, decide where the center of vital interest is, then you have to see where they had their ha um, habitual abode, so where they lived uh, habitually. And also the guidance I just spoke about is saying about that, that if someone spends time in another country, that shouldn't change their habitual abode. So yeah, maybe based on domestic 
basic rules, you will become a tax resident in a certain country, but yeah, you really have to claim the tax treaty uh, then and use a tiebreaker rule uh, in that. So I hope it works um, out this way, what we will we'll see uh, the coming month and years, I would okay, say. That's, that's helpful. Thanks, Tamara. So I think it's, uh, uh, you know, fingers crossed for some, uh, some leniency and understanding, but we have tax treaties to fall back on um, as well. So I guess consider the the, the position as a whole. Um, that's been really interesting. Thank you all for the um, for the participating in the in the in the panel discussion so far. I think at this point we're just going to move on to some of the Q and A questions. Um, just want to make sure that we've got some time to at least um, cover some of these. And we've had some uh, questions coming in from the from the floor. So if I can run through these as a as a start, and then when we see if we get to at the end, if we've got enough time, we'll have a final word from uh, from each of you as well, or from at least from Alex as our as our guest. Um, so there is a question here. So what are the key considerations in renting out property in the UK living abroad? And that's from uh, from Norway. So I think Brad may be coming to you for that question. Yep, absolutely, Richard. Um, so I think uh, from a tax perspective, um, renting UK property, it, it's, it's going to be taxed in the UK um, in, in short. Um, you may be able to deduct some allowable expenses um, incurred in connection with the renting of that property, but um, it is going to be subject to UK tax. You are going to have to um, submit UK tax returns and pay the tax on, on that income. Um, you may be able to apply for um, the, the rent to be received gross without a deduction of tax, which would otherwise apply automatically um, with the tenant or the um, rental agent withholding that tax and paying it over to the UK tax authorities. Um, but in terms of, I suppose, the wider considerations, it's um, touching what Tamara just, just touched on, the double tax treaty. So if you're a resident in um, Norway, was it Norway, Richard? If you're a resident yeah, Norway. in Norway, how are Norway going to tax this income under their domestic rules? Um, if they are going to tax it, then what's the interaction between the two countries under the treaty um, to give credit, perhaps in Norway, for the UK tax suffered on that, um, on that rental income? Okay, thank you very much. And um, we've also got a question for you, Alex, which is, uh, what immigration trends are you seeing further afield outside of Europe? Yeah, so it, it, it's, it's been very interesting. I think what we are seeing increasingly is that um, the drivers behind people relocating um, are, are moving towards you know, a need for political st stability, um, infrastructure, healthcare provisions, etc as the, the key considerations for clients. So in terms of trends outside, what we are seeing is people are looking at jurisdictions such as Australia and, and New Zealand, which offer, for example, uh, routes to residence or citizenship through investment, although routes to citizenship are uh, quite prolonged in those jurisdictions, um, or for people establishing businesses there, uh, or entrepreneurs, we've seen them introduce some quite attractive uh, options. and. Whilst there have been some difficulties in terms of traveling to those locations during COVID, we have seen clients obtain the immigration or residence status in advance with the intention that they're going to move there as, as things are now inevitably opening up. So, uh, yeah, we are seeing a move to people considering perhaps jurisdictions which may be further away or are not considered um, so prominently previously um, because of the political stability um, that they are seeing in, the, in those locations. OK, thank you. Um, and I guess this one may be to Tamara. There's a, there's a question around compliance. So, um, you know, individuals can sometimes get things wrong and end up um, um, in inquiry positions with, with tax authorities. Um, you know, but what do you see as the pitfalls that, that um, you know, the common pitfalls that where people end up in these inquiry positions? And, you know, how do we go about uh, solving those with tax authorities? Um, now, I think what we see, um, because I uh, assume you mean uh, referring to relocation, um, yes. is that uh, when people uh, are considering to relocate or when they decided to relocate, they are very much focused 
on their new country. And uh, many times they seek advice uh, already up front uh, regarding the new uh, country. They go to a local advisor, um, seek to, uh, some advice about the new um, jurisdiction they were um, going to. But they totally forget that they also still have uh, to fulfill some obligations in um, the current country or, uh, for example, um, they still have a lot of ties uh, with that uh, current country. So they didn't break their tax residency um, in a country. So they still have a lot of obligations to um, fulfill and even sometimes also still have tax obligations in that other country. But, but because they are so focused on their new uh, jurisdiction, they totally forget about um, that. And yeah, I think the key issue is here that in relocations, people should seek for a cohesive advice to an advice where and uh, uh, the legislation of the new country and the old uh, country is uh, considered. Uh, because I see some, too many times that those advisors, uh, when they yeah, just go to local advisors, um, that they are not compatible. So yeah, I think that's the main yeah. pin pitfall I see. Bit for uh, us, yeah. I'd agree with that as well. I think what we see sometimes is when you have your exit plan at home and your entry plan somewhere else and yeah. it's not together, things fall down the crack in the middle. And, and that's yeah. where I see clients ending up in inquiries, um, inquiries with. Yeah. Um, and there's another one here, which is, I mean, I guess it's uh, unusual, Brad, for us to go through a whole webinar without mentioning the UK non-DOM <laughs> regime. <laughs> um, so uh, there's a question here, is, is the UK still an attractive jurisdiction um, after the 2017 deemed domicile changes? Uh, yes, in, in, in short. So um, there was, uh, I mean, it seems ages ago these changes came in actually now. Um, time has flown by, but... Um, yeah, the, the, the changes that were, were made, um, the, the, the remittance basis is, is still there. It's still very attractive. Um, it provides up to 15 years um, under this regime before you become deemed domicile. So um, broadly, your non-UK source income gains wouldn't be taxed in the UK unless you remitted it to the UK. Um, and even then, we have um, exemptions such as... Um, business investment relief where you can actually bring the money into the UK to invest in the UK um, without paying tax on that um, non-UK source income or gains. So the tax regime remains attractive. Um, and obviously the UK is, is well developed. Um, and one of the findings from the, the research we undertook in 2019 was uh, the high net worth individuals were um, looking for compliant destinations. They're worried about um, transparency. Where's the line actually going to be drawn? Um, so getting their global filing obligations right is important for them um, from a reputational perspective. And if they're in the UK, which is a well-developed compliant country, and it's got a favourable tax regime for new arrivers, I think um, the UK is always going to remain attractive. Okay, thank you, thank you. And, and um, Victoria, can you just confirm that I've picked up all of the, the Q&A questions there? Yeah, that was everything, Richard. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, I, I guess just, uh, we've got a few minutes left. Alex, if I could just come to you for a, a, for a final word as a, as a guest speaker. We talked a lot around all of the trends that are, um, you know, uh, for people either leaving their home countries or relocating to new countries. Um, we talked about Brexit, COVID, um, lifestyle, political stability. Is there any sort of final words that you'd like to, to mention or other things that you're seeing that we haven't covered today? Yeah, thanks, Richard. Uh, you know, I, I I agree entirely with you know everything we've been discussed. I think what what we've seen with with Brexit and then more recently with with COVID nineteen is we are seeing a shift in what's driving people's relocations, and I think that's been borne out by your research. So, uh, you know, more and more we are seeing people looking at political stability, infrastructure, healthcare provisions, etc., as the key considerations before they they relocate. And, and in general, we're seeing longer term strategic planning be absolutely key. And I think that is the, the key message that I would reiterate, that, it, that it's absolutely vital now more than ever 
taking into account Brexit and then the impacts of, of COVID-19. And you know, just as an, as an example of that, five, 10 years ago, we saw a lot of interest and a lot of work in the citizenship and investment programs, um, for example, in the Caribbean. So St. Kitts, Grenada, uh, you know, these are seen as very popular and, and seen as sort of a, a quick and relatively cost effective way to um, for clients to obtain an alternative residence. There may have been tax reasons, for example, behind that. Uh, but in, you know, over the last few years, we're really seeing clients uh, reassess whether these options actually bring a, a tangible benefit beyond having a, another tra uh, travel document. And so increasingly looking at, at compliance stable uh, countries, which can provide them with an attractive place to live. Um, and then in light of COVID-19, perhaps somewhere that they can work remotely from for extended periods, which I think, again is, is another increasingly uh, important consideration for clients. Fantastic. Yeah. And, and I'd um, entirely echo that as well from a, from a tax perspective um, that, you know, as I said, many years ago, we used to see the uh, a shift towards tax havens. That's not really the case anymore. Um, clients want to be in those political stable countries. They want to be somewhere where they can rely on tax treaties, and have full compliance to be able to show to their home countries where they've moved from uh, that they've done everything correctly as well. And uh, they don't want to be on the on the radar and under you know long running HMRC inquiries, especially with this shift of global tra tax transparency and exchange of information. We're in an entirely different world now. Um, but as we've heard from today, there are um, many compliant political stable countries that have um, tax benefits for new residents that we wouldn't necessarily think of. And we're going to share the Global Opportunities Report after this um, call. So uh, it, it's a quite a thought provoking thought leadership piece that uh, hopefully you'll find interesting. So uh, I, I hope um, you've enjoyed the call to all of our attendees today um, we've covered quite a lot you know push and pull factors from relocation um, the accidental tax residents um, as, a, as a result of covid other various different trends for, for relocation around the world we've covered the tax and the immigration issues which should always be hand in hand um, so please do pick up the phone to alex if you have those um, those those worries around um, immigration for your for your clients as well. Um, so it just, it just leaves me to say a huge thank you uh, to all of our attendees for um, calling in today and supporting us. Um, but a really special thank you to all of our um, panel guests here today, uh, Tamara, Brad, and our um, external guest, Alex. Um, it's, been a, it's been a lively discussion, an interesting one, and certainly you know, I'm gonna walk away with a few points to think to uh, uh, discuss with my clients as well. Um, and at that point, I think we'll just uh, we'll go to uh, to a close. Um, I'm sure the um, uh, the BDO marketing team will be following up with you afterwards with some material, but also to uh, gain some some feedback. Um, take a look at our World of Private Client uh, series um, and our survey, um, and we look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Thank you, and wishing you a good day.